Okay, so we're there in Luke chapter number 5. And the passage I want to draw your attention to this morning is at the very start of the chapter. Let's have a look at the very start of the chapter. Verse number 1. It says, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him, it's upon Jesus, to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. So notice here people are pressing forward to hear the word of God. You might want to ask yourself, is that the attitude that I have about God's word? What I describe myself, am I someone who's pressing forward to hear God's word? Or is it just, you know, oh, I'm just pretty ambivalent about it? No, I mean, we should have that attitude. That's the attitude we should have about God's word. And we've just had a chance to, um, to put that into practice. We've just done, gone through the Bible March. You know, in the month of March, we try and read through the whole New Testament um, in that month. Okay, it takes nine chapters a day to do it. Um, for some people, it's a bit of a stretch. But it's like, this is a chance to say, look, is that my attitude, to press forward to hear the word of God? You see, because many people are pressing forward to hear the words of men. Okay, instead of hearing the word of God, they press forward to hear the words of men. What they do is they read commentaries. They have a whole pile, they might have a bookshelf with a whole pile of commentaries, and they spend their time reading their commentaries. You know, maybe they have study Bibles. If you've ever seen them, I haven't got one here, but I should probably bring one. Like a, a big fat Bible, it's huge. And you think, well, why is it that some people have a Bible that's so big, it's like you could hit a burglar on the head with it, it's, a, it's like a huge weight. Why is it that this Bible is so small? Do you know why this Bible is so small? It's not because it's got small, fine print, it's just got reasonable, readable print. The reason is because the only thing in this Bible, pretty much the only thing, is just what God says. You just page after page after page, there's no notes. There's nothing except this is what God says. Okay? And so... But many people, they, they'll, they'll read a commentary, they'll read a study Bible, and many of these study Bibles, they've got a lot more notes than they do have the actual Bible. You know, there'll be a little bit of text, and there's a whole pile of blah, 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 blah. Okay? Um, or maybe they'll read books about the Bible. You know? I mean, go to a Christian bookshop. Not that I'd recommend it, but you go to a Christian bookshop, and what do you find? You'll find there's a whole pile of stuff for sale, a whole pile of books, but most of them are not the Bible. There's all sorts of other books about all sorts of other, about the Bible. And then if you go to the back, you'll find a little wee section with the Bibles in it. And amongst that, you'll find like one little wee shelf, with the, certainly in Dunedin here, with the King James Bible. That's what you find. Whereas all these other ones, okay? And so what you find is that people, what they really need is God's word. But instead, they're pressing in to find other things, to find what men have to say. Well, that doesn't match what Jesus said. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4? Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's what we need. We need the words that come from God's mouth. Turn if you would to Luke chapter number 10. You're there in Luke 5. Just look across at Luke chapter number 10. Luke chapter number 10 and verse number 38. Luke chapter 10 and verse number 38. Luke 10, 38. It says, Now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Notice what Mary's doing. She's sitting at Jesus' feet and hearing his word. But Martha was much cumbered. So was cumbered about much serving. She's bothered. If she's got this work she's doing, she's serving and she's cumbered. It's bothering her. And came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. That sounds reasonable. I thought obviously she's probably in the kitchen, she's probably preparing food and doing all sorts of stuff. And she's saying, look, my sister is just sitting listening to you. Tell her to come and help me. Well, what did Jesus say? Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful. That means full of care. She's worried and troubled. You know, being careful, being worried, being troubled about many things. You've got all sorts of things you're worried about. But one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. So notice we're saying, you're worried about all sorts of things, Martha, but guess what? One thing is needful. There's an important thing, you know? And the fact is, God's word is the important thing. You know, we need to be reading our Bibles. Now, we do have other things we need to do. It's not that we read our Bibles 24-7, but the fact is, that's why I'm, I'm strongly in favour of reading the Bible first thing in the morning. You get up in the morning, and the first thing you do is open your Bible and read. Do it first. Because do you know what happens if you do it first? Do you know what happens? It gets done. Whereas if you don't do it first, it might not get done. You, you know, the, you know the, 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 there's, there's, a great, there's, there's a great saying 
I mean, that's why, once again, first thing, you do it first thing in the morning. So the very first thing you do, it's like when you're wide awake. Like, because if, if you if you did it late, late at night, I'll do my Bible reading late at night. And hey, I read my Bible late at night sometimes. But guess what? If you read it late at night, you might fall asleep. And then it wouldn't get done. But if you do it first, there's a great saying I've heard um, many people use, no Bible, no breakfast. Now, I don't know about you, but when I wake up in the morning, more often than not, I'm, I'm normally pretty peckish. You know, I'm ready for, I'm not, I'm not quite as hungry as Nathan. Now, Nathan, he really does get hungry in the morning when he wakes up. But um, I'm really pretty hungry. But if you've got this urgent, you've got this physical need to say, look, I need to eat. But say, look, no Bible, no breakfast. In other words, don't eat until you've read your Bible. That'll give you motivation to read your Bible, okay? And so you say, look, one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part. There's a lot of things we can do, but we need to make it important. And we can carry that across to, I mean, other things. I mean, the same thing applies with church, you know? Coming to church is something God tells us to do. We should come to church to hear God's word preach. A lot of people, we've got all sorts of things in our life. Well, I've got to do this instead. I've got to do this instead. I've got to do this instead. And we come up with reasons not to do what God said to do. Okay? But Jesus said, look, no. One thing is needful. One thing is important. Mary had chosen that good part. What she was doing, that was the good part. Turn back, if you were, to Luke chapter number 5. Luke chapter number 5, and look at verse number 2. Luke chapter 5, verse number 2. He says, and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. So notice, why is it that they need, they were pressing to, to hear God's word. Why is it that we need God's word? Because what does he do with it? He teaches the people. He teaches the people. We need God's word so that it can teach us. Look, if you would, at 2 Timothy. Keep your finger on Luke 5 because we're coming back there constantly. But look at 2 Timothy, chapter number 3. 2 Timothy, chapter number 3, verse number 16. Very famous verses in the Bible. 2 Timothy 3, 16. says, all scripture, that's God's word. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It comes from God and is profitable. That means it's valuable. That's something that's going to profit you. It's profitable. What for? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. He says, look, all scripture is profitable. This is what we need. We need God's word. And it's profitable for doctrine. It's, for, it's to teach us. Look, if you would, back at Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter number 17. Deuteronomy chapter number 17. And here, back in Deuteronomy 17, we see commands that were given to um, the king of Israel. Deuteronomy 17, page 220. Deuteronomy chapter 17. And there was instructions that were given, basically, for what was supposed to happen when you set a king over you. Now, God didn't want them to set a king over them. But they said that we want to be like the people around us. We want to have a king to fight our battles. And they ended up getting into all sorts of trouble when they had a king. Because God was supposed to be their king. Okay, But nevertheless, he said, okay, when you do set the king, this is what the king should do. And it goes to all sorts of things. Don't multiply wives. What do the kings do? They multiply wives. Why? Because men shouldn't have the sort of power that, that these people had. It's not normal. It's not natural for someone to have that power. And when, I mean, you've probably heard the saying, power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Well, the fact is, when people have power, it's a bad thing. It's a dangerous thing. And that can be in all sorts of areas, okay? Um, but certainly in the case of a king. But notice it says here in verse number... Verse number 18, it says, Deuteronomy 17, 18, it says, And it shall be, when he, talking about the king, sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book, out of that which is before the priests the Levites. says, so look, he's going to take and make his own copy of God's word. He's going to make a copy of it. Make him a copy of this law in a book, out of that which is before the priests the Levites. Verse 19, And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein, all the days of his life. Notice that, not some of the days of his life, all the days of his life. That he may learn to fear the Lord as God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. So why does he have it? He has it so he can learn. The king of Israel needed to read all the days of his life in order to learn. Okay? And so it's an important, that's an important principle. That's an important principle is he needed to learn God's word. He needed to be doing it all the days of his life. Um to keep all the words of this law and his statutes to do them. So he needed to read it and learn it and then do it. That's the point of the Bible. You want to read the Bible so you can learn what the Bible says and then you can do what the Bible says to do. Okay, learn what it says and then do what it says. Look back in Luke chapter number 5. Um, 
Luke chapter number 5, verse number 4. Luke chapter 5 and verse number 4 says, Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Lord, charge into the deep, and let down your nets for a draught. So he says, look, Jesus tells them to do something. And so hearing from God should always result in action on our part. God's telling us to do something. You know, we should think, what is it that you're wanting me to do? Okay, in fact, there's a, there's, there's a great method that can be really helpful to use when you're studying the Bible. You know, ask yourself these three questions. As you study the Bible, you're looking at a passage, read it, and first of all say, what does it say? What is it actually saying? Just straightforward, what is God actually saying? But then beyond that, what does it mean? What does it mean? And part of that would involve, you know, you need to look and say, well, okay, who is being spoken to here? You know, who is being spoken to here? You know, when were they being spoken to? Who, who's doing the speaking here? And why are they speaking? So, for example, back then, we could look in, when we looked in Deuteronomy 17, it was being spoken to the king of Israel. Now, some people would say, well, okay, well, that's spoken to the king of Israel. I'm not the king of Israel. doesn't apply to me. But think about what it's saying. It's saying the king of Israel should make a copy of God's word. He should read that copy of God's word so he can learn and he can do what it says. Do you think that applies to us? Yeah, it does. In fact, no doubt you might say, well, I'm not a king. The Bible actually says he has made us um, kings and priests unto God and his father. The Bible says we are kings, we are priests. And there's other places to talk about what priests are supposed to do too. They're supposed to learn God's word, obviously, because they're supposed to teach it. Okay, so what does it say? What does it mean? But then what should I do? What should I do? Look, if you were, you're at Luke chapter 6, look at Luke, sorry, Luke chapter 5, look just across the page at Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, verse number 46. Luke chapter 6 and verse number 46. Luke 6, 46. Jesus said, and why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? He says, why are you calling me Lord, but you're not doing what I say? He says, whosoever cometh to me, and heareth my sayings, and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house, and dig deep, and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house, and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But... He that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So he's contrasting someone who hears and does versus someone who hears and doesn't do. The person who hears and doesn't do, it's like his house is built, you know, it's like it's built on the sand. The storm comes and what happens? Crash, it falls down. You know, when bad weather comes, you know. And so, thing to understand and we can see here, you're going to get bad weather. No matter where you, no matter where you build your house, you're going to have bad weather. You'll have bad things that will come into your life. Disasters will come into your life. We'll go through trials and tribulations. But if you do what God says, guess what? Your house is going to stand. Your house is going to survive. Um, James talks about the same sort of thing. James chapter number 1. James chapter number 1 and verse number 22. Right towards the back of your Bible, just after Hebrews. James chapter number 1. In verse number 22, it says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. He says, Be a doer, not just a hearer. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So notice what he's saying here, look, he says, look, if someone, it's like somebody who looks at their face in a mirror. He looks at their face in a mirror, but then, if you don't do what it says, it's like you go away and you forget what you even look like. You know, I mean, maybe you look in the mirror and maybe you've seen, you know, you've got some food on your face. Yeah, we owned it for some food after the service this morning. You know, you go and you, and you end up with a whole pile of, you know, sauce or something in your face. You look in the mirror, you see it, and then you think, oh, I'll do something about that later. Well, if you think that, what's going to happen? You forget about it. And you go around, you know, in a mess. Instead, look and see, this is the problem. Fix it. Because otherwise, in fact, that's what it actually says. You'll be a forgetful hearer. And the thing about it is, we forget. We, we forget. You know, I mean, I was, actually, I was actually just, not that long ago, I was listening to some of, I listened to a couple of my old sermons. And um, you might think, that's a bit strange. What would you go back and listen to your old sermons for? Well, I listened to sermons from people that I've heard that was a good sermon, that I've heard multiple times, because do you know what happens? I forget. You know, I forget. When I've heard a good sermon from someone, I, time goes by and I forget it. And well, guess what? Sermons that I preach, I forget what I preached. 
You know? And when you go, and, and when, every time I've gone back and done this, I've listened and thought, wow, did I really say that? Wow, did I, did I, where did that, where did, why? Because at the time I studied out of God's word and preached it, but then time goes on, I forget. Well, if you forget your, you know, your own sermon, you're going to forget other things as well, you know? And so, but it's just, that's why it's important. If you don't want to forget something, you have to be doing it. That's why every time you hear a sermon, think, what is this telling me to do? And then if you do that, then you'll remember. You know, I mean, I work with computers, and computers, it's, it's one of those things, it's like a, it's a, it's a field that's just, it's just growing, expanding all the time. It's just, there's just so many, you can't, you know, be an expert in all the different areas of it. And the thing is, there are some things that I know a lot about with, to do, relating to computers, and there's some things that I just know hardly anything. Now, a lot of things that I've learned, but I don't use, and guess what? They're gone. But the stuff that you use, the stuff that you do, that's what you remember. That's why it's so important to do, because when you do, you'll remember, but if you don't do, then you'll forget. Okay? And so back at, um, back at Luke chapter number 5. <coughs> Luke chapter number 5, and verse number 5. Luke chapter 5, and verse number 5. Actually, just take that back. Hold your finger in Luke 5, and look back again at James. So, because Just as we're there, there's another couple of verses that I just want to read at the end of where, that passage we were in James. Look at James chapter, chapter number 1. Excuse me, James chapter number one. We got up to verse number twenty-five. Look at verse number twenty-six, because then it's because it talks about you know um, the person who, who who looks on the law of liberty, continue with her again therein. He's not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. He's going to be blessed. That's the path to blessing. And then he goes on and says, verse twenty-six: If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Now one of the things he's talking about here, he's saying, look, if you, this person seems to be religious, but he doesn't bridle his tongue, this is someone who hears the word but is not doing it. Because if you read the book of James, what does he talk about? The tongue. A lot. It comes up over and over again. He talks about the tongue. Verse number 27 says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So he's saying, look, if you're someone who you say you're religious, but you don't keep control of your tongue, he says, look, you're, um, you're deceiving your heart, your religion is vain. You know, you're, you're, it's, it's worthless, it's empty. And that's a, that's, a, that's a real warning that we need to take heed of as believers. We need to bridle our tongue. We need to guard our tongue. That's an important thing. Every believer needs to. Pastors need to bridle their tongue. A lot of pastors, especially independent Baptist pastors, they like to shout their mouth off. I mean, it's just sort of some culture they have where they just, they like to say stuff and I'm going to say this and say that. Well, the Bible says you need to bridle your tongue. There's a time to, the Bible says, spare not, cry aloud, you know, um, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, you know, show my people their transgression, the, the house of, of Jacob their sin. The Bible does say that, but it also says to bridle your tongue. You need to be careful. Be careful of what you say. And then it says, notice this, pure religion. See, because some people are anti the word religion. They say, oh, it's about a relationship. I'm not religious. Well, the Bible talks about religion. And it talks about it favourably. It says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. There is such a thing as pure religion. There is good religion. Religion is a good thing, providing it's the religion of the Bible. Now, false religion, obviously, that's a bad thing. Okay, and, and one of the descriptions of it is, look, it's saying, look, to visit the fathers and widows in their affliction. Going and helping people. The fathers and widows. And how about a great way to visit fathers and widows? How about going out and preaching the gospel? Because yeah. a lot of fathers, a lot of widows that are at home, that you can knock on their door and you can preach them the gospel. You know, you could bring them a food parcel. But better than that would be to bring them the food of God's word. And to keep himself unspotted from the world as well. Unspotted from the world. That's that whole, be not conformed to this world. You know, when the world's doing something, we shouldn't be like the world. We should be different from the world. You know, we shouldn't be into all the movies and the, and the music and all the, all the things that the world thinks are great. That's not what we should be like. We should be unspotted from the world. You know, let's get back in Luke chapter number 5. Luke chapter number 5 and verse number, verse number 5. Luke chapter 5 and verse number 5. It says, And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night. And have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. So notice this. Simon says, look, Jesus has told him, he says, he says, look, let down your nets for a draft. 
Simon answered and said unto Master, look, we've toiled all night. We've been working all night. We've taken nothing. So it sounds as though Jesus, he's been working, they've been doing this, and Jesus, oh, yeah, just put your net down. It doesn't sound like it makes a lot of sense to Peter, does it? It doesn't sound like it makes any sense. He says, look, we've tried, and it's not working. You know? And the thing is, you can be working really hard at something, but it might not be working, maybe because we're doing the wrong thing. We could be doing the wrong thing. I mean, there's a lot of church programs which are designed to build the church. But no one gets saved. So what's the point? It's just about getting people in. Getting people in. It's just this big social club mentality. What's the point of that? Jesus said, I will build my church. He didn't say, you need to build my church. You know, many churches, yeah, they're basically just social clubs because they're spending their time doing things God didn't tell them to do. Okay? Now, I... Am I saying that's wrong to have a social activity? To go out for a meal, to go and go bowling or do something? No, not at all. But that's not the purpose of church. You know? That's not the purpose of church, you know? It's particularly when you're neglecting what God actually did tell you to do. What what God actually has told you to do. Now, in this case, however, Jesus is telling them to do what they've already been doing. He's telling them, do you know, they've already been doing it. He's saying, look, do it. So what's their response? Peter says, look, we might not understand it. Look, we've done this, we've done this, nothing's working. But he says, nevertheless, nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. So he's saying, because you've told me to, I'm going to do it. Okay? Because you've told me at your word, I will let down the net. Verse number six. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. Now, can you really imagine this? I mean, they've been fishing, and what did he say beforehand? How much have we caught? Not much. Nothing. You've been fishing all night, you caught nothing. And then Jesus said, hey, look, you know, you're washing your nets. Get back out there. Stick the net back in. They do it. The net fills with so many fish that the net breaks. And so they call, hey, Friends in the ships beside them, look, come and help us, come and help us. And what does it say? The other ship, they came and filled both the ships, they began to sink. So they caught so many fish that both ships are starting to sink. Is that a bit of a contrast? It is, isn't it? It's a contrast. But the thing is, when they obeyed what Jesus told them to do, they were much more successful than they can even have imagined. Remember when we, when we sang this morning, didn't we sing Joshua 1.8? This book of the law shall not depart out of the mouth, but they shall meditate therein day and night, that they may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then they shall make their own prosperous, and then they shall have good success. You know, it's the only times the word success is used in the Bible, is that one verse. Okay? And it's about meditating in God's word and doing what it says. Okay? Look at verse number 8. Verse number 8. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me. For I'm a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him, at the draft of the fishes which they had taken. So the response of Peter and those that were with him was amazing at what had happened and who God is, leading Peter to realise what he was like in comparison. When you realise what God is like, then you realise what you're really like. You know, I mean, so often we talk to people when we're at soul winning, and they just tell us about how what a great person they are, what a great person they are. You know, oh yeah, I'll get to heaven because I'm a good person. They don't really realise how great God is. When you realise what God is like Mm -hmm. and how great he is, then you'll have the attitude that Peter had, I'm a sinful man, O Lord. Verse number 10. Verse number 10. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. So Jesus now gives them a new purpose. So what do they do? They forsake Paul and they follow him. Now, did they get saved then? Obviously not. They didn't get saved then. And and it's it's clear when you look at at all the Gospels, you can see, you know, a lot of the people who became Jesus' disciples were already John's disciples. You know, they'd already been baptised by John, etc., etc. But what it was, is they followed Jesus. They became his disciples. Because salvation is not the same thing as being a disciple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all you have to do to be saved. But what happened here, they forsook all and followed him. They began to follow him more closely. And that's something that God desires for us. He wants us to follow him more closely. To say, what well, you're saying this, I want you to do that. 
Oh, am I talking about work? Yes, I'm saying work for God. Work for Jesus. Be his disciple. But that's got nothing to do with salvation. You know? We understand that. That's clear. Okay, so <clears throat> the title of the sermon this morning comes from verse num- n- number 5. Back in verse number 5, what did, what did Peter say? He said, nevertheless, at thy word. At thy word is the title of the sermon. Jesus told them to do something, and they did it, to a degree, as we'll see later on. He told them to do something, and they did it. Even though they didn't understand completely, they believed him, and they obeyed, and the result was being blessed. Okay, and we can see this sort of thing. This, we see this throughout the scripture. Look, for example, at, at, um, at Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter number 11, and verse number, verse number 6. Hebrews chapter 11, <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 6. It says, look, but without faith it is impossible to please him. Talking about God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them which diligently seek him. God's going to reward you when you diligently seek him. And now give some examples. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. By the which he condemned the world and became heir of the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. So, what did Noah do? He prepared an ark. Verse number eight. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whether he went. So Abraham didn't know where he was going, where he was going, but he went out. He followed him. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So notice what we see here. We see these examples. By faith, they, even though, they, I mean, do you think Noah understood? When God told him to build an ark, do you think he understood everything about it? I mean, was he familiar with, you know, lots of rain and floods and stuff like that? No. But he obeyed, even though he wouldn't understand. Abraham, he didn't know where he was going, but he obeyed. You know, um, you can look at Daniel, for example. Daniel, oh, what's the time? Yeah, look at Daniel chapter number, Daniel chapter number three. Daniel chapter number three. Look at Daniel chapter number three. Very famous, very famous passage. Um, the, the the fiery furnace. Daniel chapter number three. <clears throat> Daniel chapter three, verse number one. Daniel chapter 3, verse number 1 says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits and the breadth of six cubits, and he set it in the plain of Jura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the councillors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And whoso, look at this, whoso falleth not down and worshippeth the same image, sorry, and worshippeth the same, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. So Nebuchadnezzar, he sets up this image, he says, look, when I play the music, everyone bow down and worship, or what's going to happen? You're going to be thrown into a burning fiery furnace. Well, look and see what happens, look at verse number, look at verse number 12. Because not everyone did that. There were people who didn't do that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, no, we're not going to do that. Verse number 12, there are certain Jews whom they have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three men, O king, have not regarded thee. Notice this, they serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto him, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you be ready, at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made, well. But if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that should deliver you out of my hands? You say, look, I'm giving you another chance. Picture yourself there. You know, you've been dragged in front of, you know, some wicked government. Doesn't sound like too hard to imagine. Dragged in front of some wicked government, and you're told you've got to do this. You've got to bow down and worship this image. And if you don't, 
into the fiery furnace. It kind of sounds like things that are going to happen in the end times events, doesn't it? We're supposed, supposed to worship the, the beast um, and, and take the mark of the beast and so forth. He says, don't do it or you'll be thrown into the furnace. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer them in this matter. Like, they're not filled with care, we're not worried. Yeah, we're not, we're not worried about answering in this matter. He says, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. So they say, look, God can deliver us, and we think he will. But then they say, but if not, if not, even if God doesn't deliver us, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So they say, look, God can deliver us, and we think he will, but even if he doesn't, tough. We're not bowing down. We're not, change, we're, we're not going to bow down and worship. Have a look um, at verse number 23. Verse number 23. So, um, and these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound in the midst of the burning fire furnace. He gets wild and throws them in there. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counsellors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So what happened? He protected them. They were saved in the midst of that burning fiery furnace. And then look down at the end of the, at, at the, end of the chapter, um, verse number 30, I think it is, chapter 30. Then, after it's all done, they, they come out, verse number 30, then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So they resisted, they didn't bow down, they went through the hard time. Lo and behold, they get saved from that and then they even get promoted by Nebuchadnezzar. You see, because we need to understand, the Bible actually says in Psalm 75, 6, promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge. He putteth down one, and he setteth up another. God is the one that can promote you. See, a lot of people think, I've got to do this. I'm going to disobey what God says because you know, well, I need it. I need this job. I need this, I need this money. I've got, to, I've got to do this thing. You know, I'm concerned about what people are going to say. And so I, I, I just have to. No, I know God says not to, but I'm going to do it anyway. You know? I mean, some, some people have gone through things where you know, people are applying for jobs and things. I mean, I've been applied for a job for, for a long time, but... You never know, working at the varsity, it could be, you never know how soon it could be. Um, but the thing about it is, if I apply for a job, do you think I would take a job that required me to work when we've got church on a Sunday morning? Or church on a Sunday night? Or Bible study during the week? No, I'm not going to. Because why? Because the Bible says, forsake not the assembly of yourselves together. So I'm not going to do that. And I believe that by me not working at those times, God will, promotion comes from Him. He will provide. For my needs. Okay? And so, but if I say, okay, well, I'm going to miss this, I'm going to miss that. Well, is God going to necessarily provide for my needs? Not necessarily. Okay? And so it's important we understand that. Look back at, at Luke chapter number 5. Look back at Luke chapter number 5 again. Luke chapter number 5 and verse number 5. What do you say? Nevertheless, even, because, I mean, do we really understand that? When we look at things, we might think, well, if I do this, I mean, this job is paying better, or this job works these hours, or this job's going to lead to this. But we don't necessarily understand all the things that God does. But we should, we should have the attitude that Peter said and say, look, at thy word. What is God asking us to do? Is he asking us to build an ark like Noah? No. Is he asking us to go into a strange country like Abraham? Well, maybe if you see a particular a need in a particular place and we're able to meet it. I mean, Jesus did say, go into all the world. Absolutely. You know, maybe that is. Is God telling us to refuse to bow down to a golden image? Well, God hasn't changed his mind about idolatry, but how many of you have had to resist an order to bow down to a golden statue? But we should be like Peter was and say to them, look, at thy word, I will do whatever it is you want me to do. At thy word. Jesus said, look, let down your net. We should say, at thy word... We'll do what? Well, let's look at the Bible and see what God says to do. Whatever it is that he says, whatever it is he says, that's what we need to do. We need to be in God's word to see what he's telling us to do. Because if we don't open God's word, then he's not going to be telling us anything. Or probably a better way of describing it is to say that um, he's telling us, but we're not listening. You know, I mean, if I've got my Bible here and my Bible just stays shut, 
Is God going to tell me then? No, he's not. Because it's shut. I need to open it. Open it. You know? I mean, how can we live by the principle at thy word if we don't open the word? You know? Look, look, at, Matthew, look at Matthew chapter number 12. Matthew chapter number 12 and verse number 1. Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 1. Matthew 12 verse number 1, page 973. Matthew 12, verse number 1 says, At that time Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were in hunger and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Look at this, Have ye not read what David did when he was in hunger and they that were with him? How he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. Verse 5, Or have ye not read... In the law, how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless. He says, look, the problem with you guys is you haven't read. You haven't read. You're trying to say, look, you can't do this and can't do this. But you haven't read what this, a great man of God did in this situation and God was fine with it. God was fine with it. Okay? And so we need to understand that people, when they're ignorant of what God's word says, they go off and do all sorts of bizarre things because they haven't read. Look at Matthew chapter number 19. Matthew chapter number 19 and verse number 4. Matthew chapter 19 and verse number 4. <clears throat> and he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read? Have ye not read? Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. You want to say that in a lot of churches today? Have ye not read that God from the beginning made them male and female? He didn't make them male and male. You know, it's, it's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Okay, we need to understand that. It's pretty simple. And Jesus says, look, have you not read? Have you not read? Look at um, chapter number 22. Have, chapter number 22. Chapter number 22 and verse number 29. Chapter number 22 and verse number 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, ye do err. He says, look, you're mistaken. You're in error not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. You don't know the scriptures. That's why you're in error. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are the, as the angels of God in heaven. Every Mormon should read that. It's in their Bible. And yet they believe that this marriage, they talk about this, this celestial, you know, you get married at the temple here, and then you're going to have all these wives for eternity. He says, oh, well, I'll go. And the, in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which is spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So notice he says, look, once again, have you not read? And once again, if you'd read, you'd know he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. Therefore, is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are they dead? No. So guess what? There's no soul sleep. They're not dead. They're living. Okay, pretty simple. That rules out all the whole pile of stuff that the Jehovah's Witnesses believe, or the Seventh Day Adventists believe, or a lot of ignorant Baptists probably believe the same thing. I wouldn't be surprised. Okay, so the thing is, have ye not read? Mark chapter 12, verse 10 says, And have ye not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. Haven't you read it? Haven't you read it? If we want to be like the Apostle Peter and say, At thy word, we need to be in the word. That means we need to read it. Just like the king of Israel in Deuteronomy 17, 19. He shall read therein all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of his law and his statutes to do them. How can you obey God unless you know what he wants? And the place to find out what God wants is in the Bible. But many Christians today are ignorant of what God wants because they don't read the Bible for themselves. I mean, it's great to come to church. It's great to hear the Bible preach. But if you're not reading the Bible yourself... How do you know if what I'm saying is true or not? I could just be showing you particular verses that agree. When in fact, if you read the whole thing in context, you realise, he's leading me down the wrong path. That's why you need to read for yourself. Okay? I mean, what a lot of people do that. Well, I'll just, I just, I just trust my pastor, you know. I'll just go with what I feel. I mean, he's a nice man, he smiles, you know. Well, I should smile more. But, you know, I'll just trust, I'll trust, you know, I've got, I'll trust my heart. Isn't that what the attitude people have? Mm. But of course, if you read the Bible, you'd come across verses like Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Mm. Who can not? You know? Or Proverbs, um, Proverbs 28, 26, which says, he that trusteth his own heart is a fool. Mm. You know? So we need to understand, we need to read the Bible 
And, I mean, I know sometimes I might sound like a broken record. I feel like I say this all the time. Don't trust me. Trust God. You know, don't trust yourself. Trust God. I mean, do you want to know the answers for how you should live your life? The place to look is in the Bible. The place to look is in your Bible. I mean, not long ago I saw a video that was on the subject of tattoos. Okay? And there was a guy who had a whole pile of tattoos. He had tattoos, you know, all over him. And he was basically saying, it's fine for a Christian to have tattoos. Okay? And understand here, when I'm talking about tattoos, I'm not talking about what you've done in the past. If you've got tattoos, I couldn't give two hoots. It affects me not whatsoever. Okay? You can't go back and change the past. Okay? But the thing about it is, is that we need to know what God says. If you're a Christian thinking, as many young people are, should I get a tattoo? I mean, isn't it popular? Don't all the famous people have tattoos? I'll actually give you a clue to start off with. Okay? Turn, turn to Leviticus chapter number 19. Leviticus chapter 19. Because the Bible talks about tattoos. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse number 28. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse number 28. It says, Leviticus 19, 28, says, Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Notice that. Print any marks upon you. Don't print marks upon you. Doesn't that sound like a tattoo? It does. Don't print marks upon you. Okay? And in fact, the Bible also says abstain from appearance of evil. I don't even like... Do you, know, do you know how it's like popular for children to get stamps? They go and they get stamps. And what does a stamp look like? It looks like a tattoo. Okay, now, you can wash it off. But I'd rather not go there. I wouldn't... I don't want to... Because it looks like that. And some of the stamps actually do are designed to... And what it is, it gets them... In the, uh, they're used to having, you know, marks on them. And then when they get older, it's normal. I'll, uh, yeah, I'll get the real, the real thing. John expensive, okay? But look, it says here, look, don't print any marks upon you. That seems pretty straightforward. Now, the guy in the video talked about the context of Leviticus um, 1928 and what was going on at the time. You know, he said, well, you know, because of the customs at the time and this is what it was all about and it's not really got anything to do with tattoos today. And he said, well, look, he said, look, look at the verse before it. The verse before it, he said, says we can't cut our hair or trim our beards. Well, let's have a look and see what it says. The verse before it says, You shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beards. Okay, so it doesn't say don't cut your hair or trim your beard. It says, it talks about marring. Okay, and he says, he says, look, why is marking your skin still wrong today? Because the pagans did it, but the trimming of the hair which is also something pagans did, but well, that's not wrong. So, he says, look, so look at this verse, okay? So he's saying, because verse 27, he's not into that, therefore it means verse 28 doesn't apply. Okay, so I suppose maybe that means verse 29 doesn't apply either. Do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall to whoredom and the land become full of wickedness. That one's fine too, is it? No, no one's going to say verse 29 is. Okay, so if you're going to go back a verse and say, well, this doesn't apply, therefore 28 doesn't apply, then follow it down and say, okay, 29 doesn't apply. No. But the fact is, his understanding of Leviticus 29, uh, sorry, 19.27, um, the verse before, it doesn't say trimming your hair is wrong. That's not what it said. It referred to rounding the corners of your head and marring the corners of your beard. Think about that word mar. If you mar something, what do you do? You damage it. You disfigure it. Okay? And a disfigurement of the hair and the beard is what's being referred to. I mean, that's actually report, um, supported if you look at Leviticus 21.5. Leviticus 21.5 says, look, they shall not make baldness upon their head, neither shall they shave off the corner of their beard, nor make any cuttings in their flesh. Notice the same sort of thing, cuttings in the flesh. I talked about cuttings in your flesh, I talked about printing your... So the, the tattoo's not mentioned here, but it's the, uh, the other things are mentioned. And here it says, don't um, shave off the corner of your beard. So this is talking about having some strange... You know, we shave off bits of your beard. You know, same thing. People shave off bits of their head too, don't they? They get strange hairdos, if you like. Now, I, I, I mean, I've done this back in the past. I did this to one of my kids. This is, this is years ago. A long, long time ago, but I, when I was a say believer, but I did it to, to one of my kids. We had, um, must have been, this is back then, we had a TV as well back then. We were following the, the, the World Cup, I can't remember what year, it was a long time ago. He's in his 20s, late 20s now, and it was 
it must be 15 years ago, something like that. And um, Brazil was, you know, we thought, hey, Brazil, they, they could be a good team to win the World Cup. And so I shaved in the head of my boy, and he wanted me to, Brazil. Fortunately for him, they actually did win the World Cup that year, so yeah. um, it didn't embarrass him too much. But is that really the way you're supposed to be? Are you supposed to be writing things in your hair? Yeah. No. Was I wrong to do that? Yes. I was wrong. Okay? And the thing is, if you've done wrong things in the past, realise they're wrong, admit they're wrong, and don't do it again. Same thing as if you had a tattoo. Realise it's wrong, don't do it again. Now, you can try and, you can, if you want to, you can try and remove it, but from what I hear, it's painful, and it's really expensive, and it doesn't really work, from my understanding. That's why the best thing is just don't, don't do it in the first place. Okay? And so, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about don't do these things to, to disfigure you. Okay? Um, and it's, so it's saying don't disfigure your, your, your appearance. And I mean, according to history, that does record that pagans did, and the Bible even sort of kind of talks about people worshipping their gods and doing these strange ways. It says, don't, we shouldn't be do that. But obviously it's not saying that it's wrong to cut your hair. It's not saying that. It's not saying it's wrong to cut your hair. Because, I mean, 1 Corinthians 11 tells us it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Well, how is he going to not have long hair unless he cuts his hair? Okay? It's, it's, it, this is not rocket science. You see, the underlying principle, which still applies today, is that we shouldn't disfigure our appearance because we're not our own, but we're bought with a price. And we should glorify God with our bodies. That's what the Bible says. You're not your own. You know, if you, if, you ha if you have a rental, if you rent your house, can you just go in and just, I'm going to just do some home improvements, I'm going to, I'm going to knock this wall out here, I'm going to do this, and do can you do that? No, because it's not yours. Okay? Well, that's what God says about our bodies. You're not your own, you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Okay? Um, so, what this rules out, this rules out having bizarre haircuts. I mean, you see people, like with a mohawk, some weird haircut. You know, um, it rules out tattoos. It rules out whatever disfigurements people come up with. Whether it's, you know, all the various face piercings and, you know, a plate through the lip or these huge, you know, all these ways. You know, when they, they, their face, it looks like they have fall into a fishing box, you know, and the, the tackle box and all the stuff that's poking out of them everywhere. I mean, is that, isn't that disfiguring what God gave you? Does God want us to do that? No, he doesn't want to do that. Okay? Now, it is true that there were commands given at specific times. For example, dietary laws, okay, which don't apply to us today. But it's not the case that only things which are repeated in the New Testament apply to us. You know, um, I mean, Matthew. Have a look at Matthew chapter number five. Matthew chapter five and verse number seventeen. Matthew chapter five and verse number seventeen. Matthew chapter five and verse seventeen. What did Jesus say? Matthew five seventeen says, "Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy." But to fulfil. He says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle of the law, so, so, so one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whoso therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So notice what he's saying. He's saying, Look, I haven't come to destroy the law of the prophets. I've come to fulfil. In fact, don't break these commandments. And don't teach people to. So that guy was teaching people, hey, it's fine to get tattoos. Well, where's he going to be in the kingdom of heaven? Sounds like at least he's teaching people to break God's commandments. Okay? Now, what, one thing that, that people sometimes say, they say, oh, well, it's only if you, it's something's reinforced in the New Testament. Well, in that case, we can just throw out the Old Testament. We only need the New Testament. Those are the only ones we have to look for. No. You know, I mean, there are no New Testament commands prohibiting incest. There's not. There's nowhere in the New Testament that prohibits incest. But guess what? It's prohibited in the Old Testament, and guess what? It still applies. You know, there's no New Testament commands prohibiting cross-dressing. Guess what? The Old Testament does say man should wear, dress like a man and woman should dress like a woman. Okay? So it doesn't mean, okay, it's the New Testament now, cross-dressing's fine. I'm going to go and get myself a skirt. No. That's not what God says. Okay? Um, when a change has been made to the law, God tells us about it. You know, for example, you know, with the Sabbath. You know, he tells us about it. Or, or sacrificing animals, you know, or only being able to eat certain meats. You know, God tells us about that. And so I can show you in the New Testament where he says, look, for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. 
if it be received with thanksgiving, for it's sanctified by the word of God in prayer. First Timothy chapter number 4. Okay? And so he tells us that. Now obviously our salvation doesn't depend on keeping God's laws, since we're justified by faith without the deeds of the law. You know, therefore we include the man as justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So whether you've got tattoos, whether you've got long hair, whether you've got whatever, it's like, we're not, that's got nothing to do with salvation. But what did Jesus say in John chapter number, I'm thinking it's chapter 14, verse 15, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Notice he didn't say keep my suggestions. He says keep my commandments. I mean, one last point that, that should make it pretty clear Christians shouldn't get tattoos is the teaching that we should abstain from all appearance of evil. You know, not, and not be conformed to this world. You know, I mean, doesn't it seem pretty clear that tattoos are associated with all sorts of evil? I mean, I've gone down to the prison heaps and, and, and talked to the prisons and stuff down there. And If you go to the prison, aren't tattoos commonplace? Yes, they are. How about this? How about this? Go to a tattoo parlour. If you went to a tattoo parlour, go in and look around, what would you see? What would you see? Would you see godly images, or would you see wicked? You know, you'd see satanic images, you'd see nakedness, you'd see just every sort of vile thing you could think of. That's what are associated with tattoos, isn't it? So you can, you can tattoo a Bible verse on your arm if you want to, but what, are you going to go to a tattoo parlour to get it? And look around you and think, is this where I'm really supposed to be? It's foolish. Okay, it's foolish. I shouldn't tattoo um, Brazil into my boy's hair, but I shouldn't tattoo John 3.16 there either. Mm -hmm. It's stupid. Because God said not to. Okay? It's God said not to. So don't break God's laws trying to please God by doing it. Okay? Um, I mean, would you want to take your children to a tattoo parlour? Would you want to take them there? Let them see what's going on there? You know? The fact is that tattoos, along with other sorts of bodily disfigurement, Crazy hairdos, mohawks, they're associated with rebellion. When do people get tattoos? You know, when they rebel. Same thing, when, when, when do guys get earrings? When they rebel. When do guys grow their hair long? When they rebel. That's what it's associated with, clearly. I mean, just watch any, and once again, I'm saying it jokingly, if you look at any heavy metal band, what have they all got? They've got long, greasy, filthy hair, tattoos and piercings. You know, it's just, I mean... If people can't figure that out, I don't know. Anyway, let's go on. Let's get back to what we're saying. We're talking about at thy word. God says something, that's what we should do. Now remember those points we saw about when it comes to Bible and Bible, studying the Bible. What does it say? God's word says, don't print marks on yourself. What does it mean? Don't disfigure the body God gave you. What should I do? Don't get tattoos. Don't disfigure your body in any way. Okay, turn back to Luke chapter number, number, number 5. Luke chapter number 5, we'll finish up. Luke chapter number 5. <clears throat> Went longer than I intended. Luke chapter number 5 and verse number 4. Luke chapter number 5 and verse number 4. Luke chapter 5, verse number 4. Notice this here. Now when he left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. So he says, look, let down, notice this here, let down your nets for a draft. But then look at what Peter says. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. So Jesus said, let down your nets, plural, and he let down a net, singular. And what happened to the net? It broke. You see, God doesn't just, he has specific instructions. And we should obey his specific instructions, not think, you know, if God gives us these tasks to do, should I think, well, I'll just do that one, and I won't worry about, won't worry about the other ones. There's all sorts of areas where we need to be comparing what God says with what we're doing. You know, sometimes we'll say, I'll do this, God, but I won't do that. Instead, we should say, at thy word, what you want me to do, I'll do it. You know, I mean, God wants us to read his Bible. We should be reading the Bible. Now, there's different ways you can read the Bible, but read it. Read it. Read it lots. You know? What about praying? This is something God wants us to do. Look at, look at um, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5 and verse number 20. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5 and verse number 20. Oh, sorry, excuse me. First, uh, verse 16, excuse me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 16 says, Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. 
in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Isn't this what God wants? Yeah. He wants us to rejoice, and He wants us to pray without ceasing. He wants us to give thanks. That's what God wants us to do. You know, Philippians chapter number 4, Philippians chapter number 4, and verse number 6, Philippians 4, 6, says, Be careful for nothing, or don't worry about anything, don't be filled with care, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. God says, look, don't worry about things, but pray. That's what we should be doing. We should be praying. Okay? And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We should be praying. I mean, we were saying earlier on, we were saying Matthew 5, 5. It says, ask and it shall be given you. You know, ask and it shall be given you. I mean, the, 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 in fact, we might sing it later on. Um, Matthew chapter number 6, the, um, the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer, he said, look, after this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth it is as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those that trespass against us. We should be doing these, we should be praying. Mm. Well, if we, should be, if we should be doing it for daily bread, we should be praying daily. Okay? Um, you know, um, look back at, at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5 again. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 20, says, Despise not prophesyings. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Despise not prophesyings. The prophesying is like, in modern language, we use like, like preaching. So when, when a prophet was prophesying, he's preaching. He's telling people God's word. Some people despise prophesyings. That's why they don't come to church. Oh, I don't need to come to church. I don't need to come to church because, I mean, you know, I just read the Bible myself. That's enough. Well, it's despising prophesying. It says despise, despise not prophesying, but then it says prove all things. In other words, don't despise preaching, but then prove the preaching, test the preaching to see if it's actually right. Um, hold fast that which is good. You know, other things we should do. Um, look at look at Matthew chapter number Matthew chapter number three. Matthew chapter number three. Matthew chapter number three. Matthew chapter number three and verse number. Um, 13, Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to, Jor um, to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, he says, Allow it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove, and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God the Father was pleased when Jesus got baptized. Jesus said, Look, it's the right thing to do. It fulfills all righteousness. That's something God wants us to do, is to get baptized. Look at Acts chapter number 10. Acts chapter number 10. Acts chapter number 10, and verse number... Acts chapter number 10 and verse number uh, 47. Acts chapter 10 and verse 47 says, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So it's a command. God says, look, you need to get baptized. You need to get baptized. But a lot of people, they say, oh, well, I can't because of this. I can't because of that. There's only one thing that should hold someone back from getting baptized, and that's in Acts chapter number 8. Acts chapter number 8 says, Acts chapter 8 verse 36 says, And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Is there any reason I can't get baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered, said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The only thing that should prevent you from being baptized is if you don't believe, if you're not saved. If you're saved, God says, Look, Get baptized. It's a command of God. Okay? Look at um, look at Colossians. Colossians chapter number Colossians chapter number three. Colossians chapter number three. What else does God? I mean, the title of the sermon is At Thy Word. God has things that He wants us to do. And you can just pretty much turn all over the Bible and find these things listed. He wants you to be reading your Bible. He wants you to be praying. He wants you to be coming to church. He wants you to be getting baptized. Look at Colossians chapter number three. And verse number 18, Colossians chapter number 3, and verse number, oh, in fact, let's go, let's go back to verse 16. Verse 16, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let God's word be in you richly. 
and all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Verse 18, look at this. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. What does God say that wives should do? Submit themselves to their husband. Now, is that popular in today's world? It's not. But the Bible says it. I believe it. It's true. Wives should submit themselves unto their husband. Now, obviously, if their husband's telling them to do something that's contrary to what God says, you know, they shouldn't obey in that situation. But look, wives should submit themselves unto their own husbands as it's fit in the Lord. Verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Absolutely. That's what husbands should do. They should love their wives. In fact, they should love their wives in the same way that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. In other words, husbands should be willing to die for their wives. That's what God says. At thy word. That's what I'm going to do. Verse number 20. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing unto the Lord. Children, what does God say? Obey your parents. Obey your parents. That's what God says. Obey your parents, for this is well pleasing unto the Lord. Do you want to make God happy? Then obey your parents. Um, look down at uh, look at look at verse number twenty three. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Whatever you're doing, work hard at it. Do it heartily. Don't be half hearted. Don't be half hearted with your Bible reading. Don't be half hearted with your prayer. Don't be half hearted with serving God. Okay, it's important that we understand we're supposed to do what God says to do at Thy Word. Turn back to Luke chapter number five. We'll finish up. Luke chapter number five. Luke chapter number 5. There's one more thing we'll look at. Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Look down at verse number verse number 10. Luke chapter 5 and verse number 10. Luke chapter 5 and verse number 10. He says, And so it was, and so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. So what had he been doing beforehand? Fishing. He was unsuccessful at fishing, but Jesus said, look, put your net down there, and he couldn't even bring them all in. But he said, look, from now on, it's not fish you're going to be catching, you're going to be catching men. He says, and when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. He said, look, you're going to catch men, and they followed after him to do that. Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, you don't need to turn there. He said unto them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. God wants us to be fishers of men. He wants us to catch men, just like catching fish. Now, it's not exactly the same, but we're supposed to go out and spread forth the gospel. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's a command that God said to do. We should say, at thy word, you've told us to do it, and so we will do it. You know, I mean, look at, at, at um, uh, I mean, you can turn pretty much anywhere. In all the gospels, he says, look, as my father sent me, so send I you. You know, um, at the Matthew chapter 28. He gives them the Great Commission. Go and teach all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teach them to do all things whatsoever I've commanded you. You know? Jesus said, go. We should go and preach the gospel. And say, look, act by word. You've said to do it. Now, maybe you've tried it before. Maybe you've been trying and it hasn't been successful. It doesn't matter. Keep trying because God says, that's what we should do. Act by word. I'm going to do it. So... In conclusion, we've seen in Luke chapter number 5, Jesus here, he taught his disciples, didn't he? He was teaching his disciples. Jesus is going to teach us. How is he going to do it? Through the Bible. But he's only going to do it if we open the Bible. If we don't open the Bible, Jesus is not going to teach us. You know, Even when they didn't understand, maybe they were tired. Maybe they had lots of other things they would rather be doing. I mean, if you imagine this, you've been fishing all night long, and you've caught nothing, and now Jesus is there in the morning. I mean, they, they're washing their nets. What do you think they're about to do next? Go and have a sleep. And Jesus says, no, go and cast the net out. And they do it. They were tired. They had lots of other things they'd rather be doing. And they didn't even do it perfectly. Jesus said, cast out your nets. And they only put out one. But at least Peter did say, at thy word. Will you say that to Jesus? Will you say that to Jesus? Look, I don't understand how this is going to work. I, I'm tired. I'm weak. I don't think I'm up to it. But you're saying to do this, so I'm going to do it. That's the question. And, and look, uh, we've all got different areas in our lives where God's telling us, look, this is what you should do. 
Maybe you're good in some particular area. Maybe you're great at praying, but you're not very good at reading the Bible. Maybe you're great at reading the Bible, but you're not very good at praying. You know? Maybe you've, um, you know, you're great at reading the Bible, you're great at praying, maybe you've never been baptised. Whatever it may be, this is what you need to do. You know? Maybe you're not obeying your parents the way you should. You know? We need to look at and analyse and say, look, at thy word, at thy word, that's what I'm going to do. At thy word. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word, and Lord, I just pray that you'd help each one of us to have the attitude that Peter had, to say, look, we might not understand, but at thy word, I'll let down the net. And Lord, help us, help that to be a priority in our lives. At thy word, that we'll let down the net. We'll go soul winning. We'll, we'll go out and preach the gospel to every creature. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Lord, help us to lift up our eyes. You said, lift up your eyes. The fields are white already unto harvest. Help us to go. Help us to be obedient. Help us to, to go at thy word. We thank you and praise you and love you. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.